So, you know, I started out my career as an architect, as you know, um, and that probably gave me the best training in thinking at a large scale as well as a very detailed scale. So I think in architecture, you're constantly shifting between, you know, what is the big vision? And then how is this thing going to stand up? You know, what's the engineering? Hey, you're listening to the School of Innovation. I'm your host, Yaniv Korem, and my guest today is Christine Uchum. Christine is an award-winning entrepreneur and an MIT alum. She is the CEO of Everyday, a digital tutor for high school students that makes learning bite-sized and fun. Before Everyday, Christine was the Chief Product Officer at Veritas Prep. It was there that Christine incubated and launched an education app that would not only predict what students needed to learn, but would also create a custom study plan that maximized progress in the minimum amount of time. Before Veritas Prep, Christine led the product and design team at the Los Angeles-based startup Dog Vecchi. Before that, she was the director of invention at the advertising agency Deutsche, where she was also named one of the top 36 most creative women by Business Insider. Christine is best known for inventing the Copenhagen Wheel, a Time Magazine best invention. Check the show notes for more information about the Copenhagen Wheel or just Google it. Here's my conversation with Christine. Hi. Hey, Christine. How are you? I'm not I'm sure not... how to answer that anymore. I'm not either. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, Where are you, by the way? Where are you? Like, I'm, yeah, Los Angeles. In LA. Okay. Yeah. So I've been here pretty much since I left MIT. So 2010, moved here permanently. Wow. So 10 years. I don't know. I feel lucky to be in LA where there's a lot of blue skies and, yeah. you know, things feel, even though it's quiet and weird and, you know, it still is a nice place to live. So Yeah, you guys- see, we're not on full lockdown yet, but they've closed down all of the hiking trails and all the parks and everything. Obviously closed all of the non-essential um, uh, businesses as well. But, yeah. yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about every day. Like, do you guys, like, let's start with the obvious because of the situation. Do you guys have an office? Are you like, you know, on Zoom the whole day or like? None of us are there, but we do have an office. <laughs> <laughs> we're all working from home right now and it's it's really been an interesting time in the business mm. because you know we're in online we're in the online learning space which yeah. I'm incredibly grateful for right now um, and as schools close we're having a bunch of people transition to online learning mm. um, just to tell you what we do we're a digital tutor for high school students mm -hmm. uh, starting with standardized exams so the whole idea is that Most online learning is actually a total grind and kids don't really want to use it. Um, so we started looking into how can we make an online learning platform that's fun to use and feels a little bit more like Duolingo, if you know Duolingo, the of course. language program. Of course. Mm -hmm. so think about that but for your high school classes. Mm. Um, as people are more engaged, then their academic aptitude goes up and then that creates a nice little virtual virtuous loop um where then they're more engaged so yeah. yeah i think i think the clue is like in the name like standardized right it's like when yeah. you hear that word it it doesn't it doesn't sound fun it sounds like you know right? like like, a, <laughs> like it's standardized so <laughs> i guess it's a it's sort of for framing right we're going to talk a lot about psychology i guess uh, yeah it's like framing the experience we're going to standardize you right <laughs> And so, yeah, I, I'm assuming it's not fun. So, okay, so you guys are doing that. And how did you, how did you get into that? Like, yeah. I know you're from MIT. What the, connect the dots for me, please. <laughs> sure. So I think the two threads in my career have been always design and technology. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I started out my career as an architect, as you know. Um, and that probably gave me the best training in 
thinking at a large scale as well as a very detailed scale. So I think in architecture, you're constantly shifting between, you know, what is the big vision? And then how is this thing going to stand up? You know, what's the engineering? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that kind of trained me pretty well. And, you know, at MIT, it was just further exploration of those two ideas, design and technology, and how we can combine those two things to help people. Um, I spent a few years after that consulting and working with large-scale government organizations as well as some private companies around what they could do with their big data and how they could harness that to build products and services that Mm. could help the world. Um, So, yeah, I did that for a few years. Then stumbled into a job as the director of invention at an advertising agency, which was completely different. Um, I remember that, inventionists, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the whole thing there was... Traditional advertising, TV, radio, and print is really just a, you know, one-way mechanism where we tell you about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the goal with the invention department was that we create apps and products and services and websites that can have a much stronger relationship between uh, the company and and the customer. So Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, We worked with a company called eSurance, so an insurance company. And we built a little gas price predictor for them where you could find the gas station that has the cheapest gas near you. Um, It doesn't kind of, that doesn't feel like an ad. It more (laughs) feels like a utility. Uh, But what it did is it really helped solidify their relationship with their customers Mm. and solidify their position as, you know, a helpful company that really wants you to, that looks after you and wants you to do well. Because it provides you with value. Yeah, it provides you with value. So we used to run these really fun 10-day invention sprints um, hmm. where we'd take a problem and then, you know, look at kind of the area of opportunity and what the competition was doing. And, and then from that, define five to eight ideas uh, that we would take back to the company. Uh, and from there, we'd kind of go into a six-week rapid prototyping, um, r- rapid prototyping experiment. So kind of building what we were talking about, hmm. which, yeah, was, was really fun. It was... Um, yeah, it was something that we really honed to perfection. Um, I was there for about four years. I learned a wow. lot about branding and, and marketing as well as building mm. things. We had an internal team of tech people. Yeah. Um, I left there to kind of work in other startups. Uh, I worked in a startup called Dog Vacay in LA. Uh, mm-hmm. That got sold in 2017. And then that really kind of put me on my latest trajectory, which is applying design and, design and technology to education and improving the education system. So I was introduced to a guy named Chad Troutwine, who at the time owned a company called Veritas Prep Mm -hmm. and became their chief product officer. And we started building out an online learning uh, app that could predict what your strengths and weaknesses were and then could customize your study journey and studying in order to maximize success in the minimum amount of time. Um, yeah, that company was sold in 2018, but there was one piece of the business we didn't sell and that was the adaptive learning technology that we developed. Uh, and we kept that and then spun out the new company every day. So, wow. Yeah. Fantastic. How'd you, how'd you get away with that? That sounds like the core <laughs> IP of the... <laughs> well, the, the company that bought us was really interested in some more about traditional um, huh? offerings so in-person tutoring and in-person classes that was really where you know they were focused on yeah. um, less of a less of an online learning company yeah gotcha gotcha I want to go back for a second to to inventionist because uh, I'm I'm looking a lot at um, you know with all this remote work stuff I'm looking a lot at these uh, remote sprints yeah. Um, or, you know, design sprints done or conducted remotely. And so I'm curious, like you said, you guys were running these sprints, uh, but were you doing it with the client or by yourself coming up with these ideas and then pitching them to the, to the client? Just no, curious. it was a collaborative process, um, yeah. but in certain areas. So basically what we would do first is we'd have a call with the client and we'd talk to them about their goals and, you know, what the brief was. Mm -hmm. And then we'd also talk to them about what they'd tried in the past, um, you know, what what success looked like, um, you know, what kind of things that they wanted to do, their desires. 
from there, we would take that and kind of look into the competitive landscape, um, some of the, the strategy. I mean, architect kind of a brainstorm session. Mm-hmm. So we'd get to come back with the client to do the brainstorm session together. And from that, you know, we'd end up with between 20 and 50 thought starters. It was really important to do that with the client because, right. you know, it helped them feel involved and engaged. And it meant that when we came back with ideas, you know, some of them would be theirs. And so <laughs> yeah, that was kind of great. Right. Um, so that was kind of probably day three or four of, of the 10 day sprint. We would do that brainstorm. Then we pretty much had, you know, from day five to 10 to put those ideas through their paces. And we had kind of a ranking system about how well they matched with the, the goals of the project. Um, and, you know, how original they were, how shareable they were. And, you know, we would mock up screens and basically create a presentation so that on day 10 we could come back to them wow. with some ideas. Yeah. Wow. That sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> I want to... <laughs> sorry it's, definitely fun. it's fun <laughs> yeah it sounds like a lot of fun i think branding that whole space branding positioning marketing i'm not an expert on any of those um but i've always been super and i guess you know it's, it's kind of because it's a it's a lot about human behavior right it's about like yeah. trying to figure out the psychology of the audience or that target audience and then the mass audience and all that stuff And I think I've always been attracted to that. Yeah. And I think it was something I knew relatively little about, you know, I was always Mm. a builder and a maker and I would, I would think about designing things, but I never really get to think about how to, um, you know, will people love this? Will they buy it? Why would they buy it? What is that psychology? And so for me, it was wonderful for four years to not (laughs) only think about building things, but also be thinking about, will it actually exist in the world? Like it's not just build it and they will come. It's like, yes. build, it, you know? build it and also architect it so that you're aligned with what people want. Exactly. Um, and more success, which actually has been great going back into kind of startups and things as well. Having, having those tools. Great. Right. So our training as architects, and I think it just became super obvious at MIT um, is very applicable to a lot of different disciplines that are not necessarily architecture like you come out of architecture school and you don't know how to design a building but you have a lot of skills that are great for other disciplines but you never get to use them because you're always fixed on i gotta i gotta build i gotta design buildings right (laughs) i don't know if you saw this this movie it's an old movie called uh, cool runnings oh yeah i remember that yeah yeah but a jamaican bobsledding team Yep. So the premise here is that architects will make the best entrepreneurs in the world. They just don't know it yet, right? Because they've got all the skills. And you are an example of that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like, Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think it provides you with really good training. Um, as I said before, you know, a lot of what an entrepreneur does is zoom out into kind of the big vision, big picture thinking, but then zoom in all the way to the details as well. And you're constantly kind of switching. And I think architecture is the perfect training for that. Um, The thing with architecture for me, though, is that it takes too long to get anything done. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, it's why I left. Um, You know, you want to build a building and once it's built, you can't change it. (laughs) You know, you're pretty much (laughs) what you have. And hopefully you'll build something else that's similar and you can take, you know, what you learned there and apply it to the new building. But really it's a very slow process of, of, you know, kind of iteration and improvement. Compare that with software and it's just so much faster. I can propose something, get it into the hands of my users, get feedback on it and change direction within Mm -hmm. a period of weeks, um, not years. Uh, So that's very attractive to me. Um, But it is something which, as you transition from architecture to entrepreneurship, it's something you you have to be, I think in architecture, we have to craft the entire thing in our heads before it's built. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we kind of draw it and then we kind of create the plans and do everything to, you know, kind of get it built. But essentially it doesn't change too much from the time that you have, you know, the first drawings to 
when it's re- in the real world because it has to get approved by people and everything else, you know, it's pretty mm-hmm. stuck. Um, one thing that I had to unlearn is trying to perfect what I was building before yes. it was built. Yes. And just to put something out there in a minimum viable way, yeah. see what people were reacting to and what they liked, and then using that knowledge and information to, you know, either build that thing in more detail or something else um, and abandon it entirely. So that's kind of the, that's the shift for me is. That's um, so true. Yeah. There's like, we're as architects, we're super anal. I think we, there's, there is no book called lean architecture, right? At least not (laughs) in the building sense, right? Exactly. You got to (laughs) spend, I remember going into, into my first job interview and yeah. the, uh, the, the principal of the studio was the first thing that she said to me that she was actually proud that for the last like 40 years, she hasn't slept more than two hours a night or, or something oh, like what? that. That was, that was like my introduction into the world of like professional, you know, practice in architecture. And she was part of that because she was a perfectionist and she couldn't go to sleep. She couldn't do anything else until she got like everything perfect. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that doesn't matter because, you know, if, as, you trans- as you transitioned into software, you understand that it's about sprints, iterations, the MVPs, right? Getting it wrong, learning from your, you know, from your mistakes, quote unquote, right? And moving on and perfecting that on the go. There is yeah. no thing like that. There, is, there isn't a thing like that in architecture. That's interesting. And I think it's because, you know, software is, unless you're a nonprofit, you know, it, it's a business. Yeah. And so... You're constantly trying to find this product market fit, um, mm. which means that you can easily build something perfectly, but nobody cares. Right. Um, and so we have to change the kind of mode of design, I think, in that sense. Um, That's yeah. interesting in the context yeah. of architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then, then by the end, like it takes five years, 10 years to build a building. By the time you finish it, it's it might not be relevant anymore, right? And it's been, Yeah, it might not respond to people in the yeah. way that you want to or you know you're kind of doing some best guesses with architecture <laughs> but at the right. same time it, it just gives you you know if you can think in 3d and you can combine all of those elements to not only have something that creates a cohesive beautiful whole mm-hmm. you know building in the landscape but also stands up but also you know kind of when you're walking down um into the lobby of the building let's say um you know it's kind of a beautiful experience if you can do that software's easy Software is too like that's just yeah yeah, yeah that's like, true okay, compared to architecture <laughs> <laughs> yes it's, uh, so it is so a good much. transition I think for people for architects who want to you know get into something else I think the natural progression usually is to go into user experience design yeah. um, and you know potentially um, visual design right. and from there kind of adding on those tools of how do you understand the business and understand iteration and then yeah. Interesting. At, at MIT, you were kind of a kindred spirit in terms of um, it, it was very obvious that you weren't there to study architecture. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was kind of like, okay, I've done that, been there, done that. Now I want to experience something else. And like you said, it was figuring out technology, design and technology that overlap. And then later you added like the human component to it which is super fascinating um how do you apply all of that at every day like let's talk about every day and how that manifests itself yeah i mean i'm in a position right now because we're such a small team we're a team of rock star team of seven um where all of us kind of wear multiple hats and Mm -hmm. definitely that's the position that I'm in right now. So I'll do a lot of the design work, um, a lot of the thinking through the strategy um, about, you know, where we want to be and how we want to get there as well as the fundraising um, and then kind of liaising with all of our partners and things as well. So, you know, every day it's such an amazing mission. Um, You know, we really want to provide, use technology to provide a more affordable solution for students who are looking to, um, improve academically during high school Mm -hmm. I think you know most students need help between ninth and twelfth grade but Mm -hmm. things like tutoring is prohibitively expensive so only about 15 percent of families can afford tutors Uh, we really kind of see ourselves as 
being for the 85 percent mm-hmm. and using technology to create a much better more engaging system <laughs> so yeah the day-to-day i mean right now kind of we've just been doing q2 planning um, because of covid19 a lot of things have changed right. um but yeah we're doing q2 planning and, and looking at kind of the big vision and then how that you know what's the one thing that we want to focus on uh, i'm becoming obsessed with just only having one metric and one goal <laughs> i think and when you have like you know 10 goals then it becomes okay to do everything yeah, <laughs> but with a small true. team you just got to focus in on one thing um and make that measurable so yeah, a lot of my time is thought is thinking about that. <laughs> okay, and have you reached any conclusions? Like, what that thing is going to be? Like, what are you going to? Yeah, focus on? right now it's that greater than thirty percent of our engaged users convert into paying users. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the goal, and there are a number of different ways to get there. You know, to do that, we need to we need to make sure that it's easy for people to pay. Uh, we need to make sure that we remove any roadblocks to payment. <laughs> 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 right. It's also like an engaging product that people want to pay for. You know, why would they pay? Um, so, and all of the questions that we have, we then go back to our, our students and our parents and we talk mm. to them. So the process really is to find the goal, talk mm-hmm. to the people who are using the product, gather the information, see the trends, and then make an educated decision that will not only serve our students, but also serves our business and helps us achieve the goal. Mm. Interesting. So how, how do you have those conversations? I mean, is it like just face-to-face or now it's not face-to-face, but like over Zoom or something? And how do you, I'm curious, like how do you approach that conversation? How do you ask them the questions without asking them the questions? Yeah, that's a great question because when you ask people things, they'll try and please you. <laughs> just, <laughs> right. yeah. um, so there's definitely an art to it. So right now, there's two ways that we're gathering information. Um, we have intercom in our product. So you know, mm-hmm. it's a live chat. And we ask people through that. So we, we trigger certain questions. For instance, on your 10th session, we might be like, hey, you know, this mm-hmm. is your 10th session. And how do you feel about every day? And you want to provide some quick feedback. And students are, you know, fantastic about that. Um, the other thing we do is we just reach out and say, do you want to help us, you know, build the future of this? And People get very excited when you ask them to engage. <laughs> then mm-hmm. the way that we talk to them is we say things like, instead of saying, oh, what do you like about us? We say, how would you, if you were talking to a friend right now, how would mm-hmm. you describe every day? Right. So, um, sort of, that, uh, yeah. Sort of get yeah. them removed from the, Right. Yeah, I get them removed from just, oh, what what should I say to please them? But like, oh, yeah, how would I describe it? Well, I'd describe it like this. And subconsciously that helps us, mm-hmm. helps them kind of um, self-define what they think is interesting about the product without right. having to say that. Uh, and then when it comes to, there's a whole bunch of techniques around pricing and things as well. Like, for instance, you never ask, how much would you pay for this? <laughs> um, you would more ask, at what point do you think that, every day would be too expensive for you, you know, at what price point? Mm-hmm. Right. And then follow it up with, you know, at what price point do you think um, it, w- it would seem too cheap or not high enough quality? Yeah. Because you don't want to anchor, right? You know, exactly. you don't want to anchor the pricing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I'm kind of obsessed with right now is the product market fit survey. Um, mm-hmm. So this is really an indicator of whether people are, you know, whether they like what you're doing. <laughs> and <laughs> so the way that works is that you say, if you could no longer use every day tomorrow, um, how would you feel? Mm. And there's three options. Very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, and not disappointed at all. Wow. So the not disappointed at all, okay, you can't really do much about those people. They just don't like your product and maybe yeah. it's not for them. But the goal is to then move the somewhat disappointed people into the very disappointed if they could never use it again. Um, And so we segment our users based on the people who are in that group, the somewhat disappointed, because we figure that those are the people who will actually tell us Mm. exactly what they would be looking for (laughs) in Mm. order to do this. Because they still care. Yeah. Yeah, because they still care. Yeah, they're like, this, you know, I'd be somewhat disappointed, but it could could improve, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Indicator. And in general, you want about 
40% or above of your users to be very disappointed. Uh, if you have that, <laughs> if you do, it is great. And you found product of it. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about the emotional aspect of it. Like, you know, someone giving me that kind of criticism, right? Or not criticism, but like honest feedback about something that I created, right? So it's, uh, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Like someone says, I'm, I'm disappointed. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, so, I'm such a perfection, perfectionist. <laughs> no one's saying they're disappointed. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> there are definitely people saying that they wouldn't care if every day went away. Um, mm. And we, you know, we need to kind of do more work talking to those people. Right now we're really focused on those people who are somewhat disappointed. Um, but my guess is, you know, you can't build a product for everyone either. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. and we are, we're an online learning product that is not, you know, if you, if you really need remedial help from the very beginning of algebra, we're not mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we're not kind of at the very low end. We're more at kind of the middle part of the curve. Like, okay, okay cool. You know, you probably have some decent foundations, but you need to improve. Right. Um, so you could imagine that somebody who's a, who's really struggling with even the basics, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be like, I wouldn't care if I could no longer use this because it's just not for them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it doesn't worry me too much when we see that. I'm more worried about the people who, you know, are somewhat disappointed. Or on the fence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, what can I do for you? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, again, it, like it's like you said, you cannot please everyone. And I think that's a really smart observation and connects to so many like stuff that I've been reading lately. Um, there's this guy, or actually two guys, but this guy called Philip Morgan, who talks about specialization for consultants. You know, you cannot please everyone. You got to know who your target audience is, who, are, who is your minimal viable audience, and just focus on them, serving them, right? Not selling to them, serving yeah. them. That's another guy I'm called Liston. I've been listening to. Okay. Um, And just, just like tune out all the other crap. Yeah, it, it, it helps decision making. Honestly, it's really hard to build for everyone all the time. Right. But if you have a really good focus on who who you're building for, then it makes decision making a lot easier. Because yeah. half the problem with being an entrepreneur is saying no to good ideas. Um, you know, we right. all have like, like I have an, I have such a long list of how I want to improve <laughs> every day. Um, but you yeah. can't do it all at once and you need a way to filter out those things. And so even though I would love to build, for instance, right now, um, a teacher dashboard so that mm -hmm. teachers know how their students are doing, um, it's not, it's just not our focus right now. It's better to have a hundred people that love your product than a thousand people that are like, meh. Yeah. <laughs> on the fence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On the fence. Exactly. If you can like find slightly them, disappointed, you can really build something just for them then you can expand out from that. You know, it's almost like you're on one lily pad and you, you know, build the perfect thing for that lily pad. And then you jump to another lily pad and, you know, <laughs> build the perfect thing But, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, let's dive into every day because I was looking at the website and I saw so many of the um, ideas and concepts that I really like in terms of like, you know, psychology, uh, behavioral economics and that sort of thing. So I want to know more about ELBS. What the hell are ELBS? <laughs> What is that? So an ELB is an ex exponential little bit. Um, it basically, it's a concept by this guy named Roy Williams. He's a consultant. Um, he also says that he's the chancellor of the Wizard Academy. Um, <laughs> so I know, I'll quote you what he says. He okay. says, they're tiny but relentless changes that compound to make a miracle. The power of an elb lies not in its size, but it's in its daily occurrence. Um, so it's a little bit like compound interest. Uh, you know, if you invest a dollar today and you keep investing a dollar every day, then right. you're going to see, you know, much more growth over time than if you just keep that money under your bed and then, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't do anything with it. Exactly. So really we think that cramming is a, terrible way to study and it actually doesn't produce results but if you can just do 10 minutes every day it's amazing how much improvement you get like it's mm. it's exponential 
Um, so we'd break all of our lessons into these 10 minute bite sized pieces into these wow. little elbs. Um, okay. so that if you, you know, if you start studying sooner and just do a little bit every day, then over time, yeah, you'll see, see much more progress. Wow. So that's, that's the concept. Okay. Um, it wasn't something that we made up, but we're thankful that somebody else did. <laughs> it's been, and it's been tested and it's been like, it, it, does it work? There, yeah, there is. I'm going to tell you like an anecdote of how it works. There have been some studies on this as well, but our head of academics, um, Laura Hubbard, she had this incredible math teacher um, and he decided that at his school, they wanted to have more people getting national merit scholarships. Okay. And the way to do that is to take the PSAT exam. So you have to take the standardized test called the PSAT. What most schools would do is they just kind of, you know, send a, let, send a letter home to the parents and say, hey, you know, PSAT is coming up. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to take it. And then hopefully some students will do well enough to get a national merit scholarship. What her teacher did is that after every single math test he also gave them a section of the PSAT starting from a much younger age so for mm. a couple of years before you actually had to take the PSAT he was exposing them to it in small bites through that wow. time interesting what that resulted in is that they had doubled the number of national merit schools merit scholars of their rival school and you know proportionally many many more merit, merit scholars than you know your average school Mm -hmm. So that that kind of was part of the insight for the product. I think it was Laura's experience mm -hmm. in how you can introduce people to concepts um, in small bites, and mm -hmm. that over time that will add up to much more understanding and um, you wow. know, kind of comprehension. That's 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 an incredible story. I mean, that's yeah. it's, a, it's a genius approach. Um, wow. Okay. Okay, I always have this kind of tension with my kids where I think the schools teach them or prep them to cram because it's like it's like this, you know, it's like the challenge with productivity. It's like busy work, right? Yeah. Where you always have to like feel like you're learning, but in reality, you can just, you know, break that whole big chunk of learning into smaller bites and then just... It's, it's more manageable. It's easier to get through, right? But they feel right. like if they do that, they haven't really studied, right? If they haven't put like the whole hour or two hours or three hours right. into it, yeah. they haven't studied. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, we have a couple of things that um, help them understand progress because I think that's mm -hmm. really important for students as well. Uh, so we have something called the readiness score, which basically is our way to predict how well you're going to do on exam day. Um, And so even after doing kind of a few challenges, your few 10 minute lessons, we call them challenges, um, then you can see your readiness score increase. Um, I will say also though, that while we would love everybody to start six months before their exam, mm -hmm. it's not a behavior right now. Uh, so <laughs> <They're still laughs> cramming. motivated. Yeah. The students who cram, you know, we can kind of give them an estimation of how often how much they need to study each day but it will increase to you know 30 minutes a day or something like that if you're the closer you are to your exam yeah it's it's dif it's difficult to i guess to plan these things ahead and i think we're all also it's like it goes back to dan Ariely's work about you know procrastination where uh -huh. you don't get that immediate reward that that immediate feedback and so it's it's difficult to save long term right like put away money every day because you don't see the end result. Yeah. Um, how do you guys solve for that? Like, I mean, if, if you adopt this, this concept of elves, right. Mm -hmm. uh, these like atomic units of, of learning, then how do you build the routine or, or build the habits to, to stick with that? So you see the, the long-term results. Yeah. So we have, you know, so each of these 10 minute micro lessons or 10 minute challenges, um, it's kind of feels like a game. So, you know, you kind of get your results after each one. So there's a little bit of a dopamine hit. Right. Then we have a concept of coins as well. So you get a certain number of coins if you get something right. And you also get coins for trying as well. Um, with the idea that you'll be able to convert those coins into gift cards over time. Um, mm -hmm. Not if we've launched yet, but something we're excited about. 
And then really a lot of it's just about reminding students too. So we have text message reminders that go out to students to be like, hey, you know, there's a new challenge. Come do it. <laughs> or we did two <laughs> challenges yesterday. Maybe you could try and do three today. Um, right. So kind of building on their existing habits. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that goes out to parents as well because there's this really positive potential correlation between parents and students and that driving engagement. So we can say, we can send a text message to the parent and say, Hey, you know, Daniel did um, 10 challenges this week. Let him know that he's doing a good job. Um, And that type of positive reinforcement also has great spin-off effects. Um, So there's like some of the ways that we get people into the habit and get them kind of feeling good about studying. Mm -hmm. I think, The big thing, though, that's under the hood that we're working on is all about adaptivity. Okay. So the goal is that I can serve you content or questions that you have a 70% likelihood of getting right because 70% is just hard enough to stretch you. Mm -hmm. It's not so hard that you want to quit. Okay. So it's almost like this, this sweet spot. And when students feel like they can succeed at something they actually keep going um and it allows us also as they keep on succeeding Mm. to keep on increasing what they're seeing the difficulty of what they're seeing so that they're getting better and better and better instead of what most online learning tools do which is hey here is your course it's broken into 12 units Mm -hmm. go for it (laughs) and it's it's just like linear it's like okay start with you know unit one and then if you find that too hard, oh, well. <laughs> like, it's, crazy. Yeah. it's because we're tracking how you're doing. If we see that it's too hard and you're getting this type of skill wrong all the time, we can actually then change your study journey so that we serve you up something that, you know, is more foundational or more basic. Um, mm-hmm. So it's really about that adaptivity, which I think will help increase engagement over the long term as well. It, it it reminds me. Correct me if I'm wrong. It reminds me of this um, this famous graph, the sort of funnel in um, uh, in the theory of flow by Csikszentmihalyi, right? Where where you're in this state of flow as you're working. You're in this mm-hmm. state of flow when you're engaged in tasks that are just at the edge of your right your ability. Yeah. They're not too hard. They're not too easy. They're just right. And the trick, I guess, is to find that balance and to keep you in that flow state within that funnel of flow. And the beauty of like every day is you're able to do that because it's all digital. Like you you have all the, the data. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, we've seen that it works, um, you know, in the previous product we built at Veritas Prep, we also use this adaptivity and improvement curves are incredible when you are able to serve somebody something that they need to know and that is at the level that they can achieve. So yeah, it's quite exciting. It's not new in the industry per se, but the way that we're approaching it is new because we also take into account your personal goals, how long you have until your exam and a few other kind of other things that we're adding to the mix. Right. Yeah. Super interesting. Do you, um, I know it might sound like a cliche question and I apologize in advance, but, and I, are you, I'm going to use the word disrupt, but <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you planning or trying to disrupt the educational space or like the traditional, um, you know, schooling system? Is that <laughs> like, is that even a, a thing, a thought? Could be a thing, yeah. <laughs> Definitely trying to disrupt the supplemental education system. The systems. supplemental. Yeah, I think there's, you know, your core education system, which, um, you know, other people are trying to tackle that. Um, but then there's this, what they might call supplemental or shadow education system, mm-hmm. which can help people. And um, right now, if you have money, you can have access to good tutors and people who will help you succeed as part of this supplemental education. But if you don't, then there's nothing really there for you. Hmm. So yeah, part of our mission is for sure to, to provide something for all people to improve. Um, 
probably from a personal level, it's also just to make online learning fun. (laughs) (laughs) Completion rates of online courses are terrible. Terrible. It's about 5%, um, even less. Uh, I'm sure you and also the listeners have had experience about buying an online course, being very excited about it, and then never completing it. It's impulse buy. It's impulse buy, 100%. Yes. Yeah. And I think that design and design can fix that. Um, I think we can create things that are more engaging. Um, So from a personal level, I just want to make it fun um, so that people people improve. So, yeah. yeah. We definitely need more fun uh, these days, I guess. We do, don't we? Yeah. We do, yeah. But I also think like going back to the, the disruption part, it might be a case of, you know, the wagging the dog, so to speak. Like, you know, it's it's this small, how do you say that? The tail wagging the dog or? Tail wags the dog, yeah. Yeah. I, um, it, you know, it might be that case where you start this small disruption in this sort of like, like you call it the supplemental space and that has an effect on, you know, the bigger space because we definitely need, and I know there are people who are trying to disrupt the, or not even disrupt, but just change or improve the educational system, the school system. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, if we move into a world with rolling pandemics, there's going to be a much more blended education system where you'll have in-classroom education going on, but you'll also have at-home online learning um, taking a, you know, um, taking a seat at the table. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. we're going to have to account for consistency across those two environments Mm -hmm. and things like, you know, attendance, (laughs) uh, the ability to assess work and hand out work. You know, right now a lot of things are still done on paper. Um, you know, homework's still on yeah. paper. Yeah. What happens when people have to learn from home? So you know, there's that question too. And then, yeah, can we move completely online? Is that possible? Um, there's a lot of schools also that are looking at unstructured schooling. Um, so, you know, kind of very self-directed, a mm-hmm. little bit more like Montessori schooling right. as well, where students have a lot of agency and can decide what they want to be doing and what they want to be learning. So that's a fascinating space for me. I don't know that we've cracked that from a digital perspective, but mm-hmm. it would be very interesting to think about. I think most of those things are, are still in the classroom. Um, but yeah, asking ourselves, kind of, what does that look like digitally? Yeah. Yeah, Bo- Bo- yeah. Bo- both of my kids are in a, in a school like that. And, um, and um, I got, I got to tell you that it, it's, you know, this whole, situation now it's 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 even affected them where that environment is a lot more you know open-ended mm-hmm. um still in this situation where everything's done digitally um it doesn't translate very well yet yeah exactly yeah yeah it, and i keep like, wondering if that, like you know virtual reality has a role to play here or something like that um I don't yeah. know. I, I sat in I sat in on their organizing Zoom calls and I sat in on a couple of their Zoom calls and it's a madhouse. It's it's not a Zoom call, it's a zoo call. It's like <laughs> it, it's insane, right? It's like you can focus and concentrate for a second. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, but even there, like there's something, I mean, we've talked about this as architects before, the importance of being able to sketch by hand and the you know ability to do something by hand and the connections that makes in your brain versus mm-hmm. just doing everything on the computer. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's still, there's still, you know, physical there. things. Yeah. Yeah. Still not there. And we have, um, you know, an access problem as well. You know, that's a big thing that's happening in the U S right now is not all, students have access to the internet or hmm. computer at home. Um, That's right. Which has forced some districts to just shut down entirely because if they can't provide education to some children, then, yeah, it's hmm. unfair. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot we're going to tackle in this new world, pandemic, pandemics. <laughs> well, you're right there, right, at the, at the forefront of that. So I, I, I think we're good hands. Um 
how can people learn more about everyday? So they can go to everyday.com and that's spelt every day, D A E um, at the end. And then, yeah, they, they can either sign up to start using the product or mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about us. Uh, we're also fundraising right now. Uh, so we're running an equity crowdfunding campaign on WeFunder as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like Kickstarter, except you actually get a piece of the company. So you own a stake of the company, um, but with you know very oh. small investment amounts. And yeah, that's going well. But yeah, if people, anyone's interested in that, they can check that out too. How do people get in touch with you? What's so this way? first name, Christine at everyday.com. And yeah, always happy to hear from people, especially people, especially parents with high schoolers, actually. If anyone's out there listening who wants to talk about that experience, <laughs> love talking to parents um, and then educators as well. Good. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I'll chat with you soon. This is really fun. Thank you for, for having me on and just catching up in general. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Take care. Stay safe. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.